Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for having me join you here today. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be speaking with you, albeit remotely, as I just returned to the mainland of Ecuador, having been on my 41st tour to the Galapagos Islands. I've been leading tours there for 20 years, and it's a destination I'll be talking to you about today. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit more about myself first. My name is Kevin Lachlan and I am owner of Wildside Nature Tours. And uh, I founded Wildside in 1993, and I'll talk about that story as we go along. But I grew up uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania, and of course I had birds like robins and goldfinches in my backyard, but even though they may be considered, you know, the typical birds of a backyard, I was still fascinated by them. And I began to draw birds on a regular basis. I absolutely love to draw, and as a four-year-old, uh, you know, drawing with crayons or pastels or anything like that. Uh, it could get quite messy, but I was amazed that my mom actually kept a few, uh, few of my uh, art pieces from my early years on, such as a, a penguin. And I never knew at that age, obviously, that I was ever going to see a live penguin in the wild, or for that matter, a toucan. But I drew them anyway. I just had that fascination. And that fascination of drawing and enjoyment of drawing grew into a uh, a love of photography. And by age six, uh, we had already traveled on a, a big trip through Canada. I turned five years old in the Bay of Fundy. And I turned six years old camping in the Tetons. And I turned 10 years old uh, camping in Glacier National Park. And Notice that word camping. Uh, we definitely were a family of five on a budget, uh, but we we always enjoyed spending time in nature. My parents wanted us to see all the national parks, and uh, and they made it happen. So by age ten, I'd been to all the lower forty-eight states and most of southern Canada. Again, by age ten, but we also had this little cabin in the Pocono Mountains, and here's where I really practiced my photography. So the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, up in northeast Pennsylvania, uh, our cabin was in a, in a state park. We had no running water. Um, we did have electricity most of the time. Uh, but my mom being a teacher, we were able to spend the summers up there. My dad would actually commute for long weekends. And I really, uh, really worked on my photography while I was there. I had a lot of time, obviously. And this was back in the film days. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I started in photography when I was about six years old. Uh, so that's over 50 years of having a camera in my hands. And at a young age, I would play around with the camera and learn what different lenses would do. I didn't get my first SLR with in interchangeable lenses till I was about 12. And uh, then I saved up my lawn mowing money and my snow shoveling money and, and bought some different lenses, uh, just used beat up old lenses. Uh, but they worked, and I was able to use uh, Rocky Raccoon here for my subject. He was uh, very cooperative, and learn how the different lenses worked and practice with them as much as possible. And then I'd walk down to uh, Little Falls Trail and other places in the park and learn about shutter speeds and apertures, using a fast shutter speed to stop the action to show the power of the water, or a slow shutter speed to give you that tranquil mood. And of course, while there, I'd be photographing nature, such as deer, but also, of course, those birds. Uh, and I'd just be on my skateboard and skateboard around the lake with my cameras and uh, never know what I would come across. I love this camouflaged ruffed grouse and this wonderful snowcock. This was the first snowcock I ever saw, and that was in the film days again. So this was just a, uh, a scan of an old slide. By the time I got my driver's license, I was traveling all over the place on my own to go backpacking. And that's when I started understanding more about how I can help protect all these places that I was falling in love with during my travels. And so what I want to talk to you about today is conservation tourism. And that has many different meanings to different people. But basically, it's protecting wild places while traveling. And that's what I've been doing for 28 years as owner of Wildside Nature Tours. But what is conservation tourism? And this can mean different things to different people. Uh, 
but basically it's making sure that at least a portion of your dollars go toward local communities and toward wildlife conservation of that specific region. So even if you're visiting a national park, your money goes into that park when you buy your entrance fee. Your money goes into the local uh, economy as you buy gasoline and stay in hotels and eat at restaurants. So that's all part of it, but it can be a lot more. Uh, if you choose to support the restoration and conservation of these areas, especially after disasters like the wildfires we've been having or hurricanes, <clears throat> this is all great reason to become a supporter of conservation tourism. You really need to fall in love with a place in order to feel like you really want to protect it. So whether you're watching TV specials or reading books, they can all help you get to that, but it's much better and uh, much more influential to actually visit these places. So read about as many places as you can and then choose where you want to visit. And having that connection by visiting that destination, that will give you that emotional link to help you really decide how and how much you may wanna help protect these destinations. So being surrounded by these wonderful parks is, is just a, a wonderful way to have a better understanding of nature and a better understanding of how you can best protect these areas. In 1992, the summer I turned 30, I spent a month backpacking through the Rocky Mountains. Now, as I mentioned, I had been to the Rockies a number of times, camping in the campgrounds, but I wanted to do something more. I wanted to immerse myself. And so backpacking through the Rockies was a big turning point in my life. In fact, it was on my 30th birthday that I decided I finally needed to get a passport and it was time for me to travel outside the US. So I asked my friends where I should go. And a couple friends had recently been to the tiny little country of Belize. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go to Belize. Now, for those who don't know where Belize is, I chose it because not only did my friends recommend it, but it's also nice and close. So you can see uh, the US, the very tip of Florida at the top of the map there, and Belize circled in green. Not that far, it's about two and a half hour flight from Miami. So from Philadelphia, where I live, to Miami is about two and a half hours. So it's total flying time of five hours. And guess what, Belize, the official language is English. So that made it even more appealing, knowing that I didn't know Spanish at all yet. <laughs> My life was about to change. So I flew off to Belize, and I absolutely fell in love with the red cap mannequins and the green honey creepers and collared arasaris and chestnut headed and Montezuma's aura pendulas and the beautiful chestnut colored woodpeckers, spectacled owls, and this one you can see peering up from its nest, colorful white necked jacobins, golden hooded tanagers, and even the scarlet macaws. They're all a huge draw to come to Central America. But there's other reasons too. I mean, look at the red-eyed tree frogs. And you may even see the amargay, one of the smaller of the five wild cats found in Belize and other Central American countries. Now Belize is also the heart of the Mayan ruins. It was the heart of the Mayan civilization. And so these ruins are just everywhere, uh, up through Mexico, the whole Patane region, Mexico and Guatemala, and even into Honduras. So anywhere you go in Central America, uh, Northern Central America, you may find some Mayan ruins, but you'll also find migratory birds like this summer tanager. Now, one of the most important things about Belize to know is they are very conservation oriented. We always hear of Costa Rica, a country that is doing a great job, but no other country has as much uh, or as high a percentage of protected land as Belize. And you can see by all the other colors on this map that are not tan are protected areas. So about 60% of Belize is protected. Some is government protection, some is you know national park or um, non-government protection like uh, Audubon sanctuaries and even private sanctuaries. So you can see way up at the top there, uh, on the left, 
kind of northwestern Belize, there's a little house-shaped brown area. And that is a privately owned reserve run by Program for Belize. And they have 300,000 acres, which when you consider the size of Belize, 8,865 square miles, the acreage that Program for Belize owns is about 5% of the country. That's a pretty good chunk for one organization to own, and it's all protected. And throughout these forests, we can find black-headed trogons and social flycatchers and yellow-bellied alanias and sulfur rump flycatchers hunting for bugs in the uh, darkest parts of the rainforest. You can really see it in those eyes. And we can also find a wild turkey called an oscillated turkey. And this was actually photographed on the program for Belize property that I mentioned. It's a very colorful turkey. And the oscillations are uh, the eye spots that are on the tail feathers. In these forests, we can find leaf cutter ants and spider monkeys. And you have to be careful. Uh, they are known to throw things at passersby underneath. We can find beautiful flowers like this Pachira aquatica, uh, locally known as the provision tree. And this is found in an area of the wetlands, uh, mainly in the crooked tree area, which is where a guy Glenn is from. And I met Glenn on my very first trip there, where he showed me uh, Rufus Nave wood rails and familiar birds like little blue herons, but unfamiliar birds like boat billed herons and tiger herons. This is a uh, uh, bare throated tiger heron juvenile. The adult has much more fine striping on it. And we'll also see birds, like I mentioned, that we may be familiar with, like white ibis and roseate spoonbills, and even American pygmy kingfishers. But we'll also find uh, forktail flycatchers. Uh, even though they're not considered a water bird, they are a bird of the wetlands. We can also find migrants like prothonotary warblers and hummingbirds like this purple crown fairy. And lesser yellow-headed vultures are relative of our turkey or black vultures in the north. We can find snail kites out looking for snails with that long hooked bill. And we can find osprey catching fish or black collared hawks also catching fish. We can find these long-nosed bats roosting in the open shade along a creek and more spider monkeys. And we can also find black howler monkeys. In fact, this is one of the best places to see the black howler monkey, which was extremely endangered. In the 1950s, the black howler monkey population crashed for a number of reasons. Hunting was one, but they also succumbed to a yellow fever epidemic. So we all know what that is like now. And from that huge loss through that yellow fever epidemic, they became endangered. In the 1980s, Dr. Robert Horwich from the University of Wisconsin had an idea of a community-based conservation system to protect them. And Dr. Rob went to farmers along the Belize River uh, in kind of north central Belize, and he taught those farmers all about erosion and sustainable farming practices. They were just doing slash and burn and cutting right up to the river's edge and having all the nutrients in the soils erode into the river every time it rained. So following his recommendations, they allowed more forest to grow along the rivers. And that way, the monkeys had a corridor so that they could move along the rivers to find food and find more monkeys. And the very first uh, farmers that he signed were a total of 11 farmers along uh, one side of the river. Today, it's well over 120 farmers that are involved with over 20 square miles of forest protected along the Belize River. So it's pretty amazing what Dr. Rob did helping with conservation there. And when we visit, our dollars go towards the continuation uh, of protecting this area. And that can be from the entrance fee to get into the reserve and, and the visitor center, and then hiring a local guide to take us out. And that money goes back into that community. We stop and have lunch at one of the restaurants nearby, and that's all ways of helping to protect that area. Giving the local people reason to preserve it 
and us uh, in in the long run with our money coming there to uh, to add to the local economy will help protect that for many years to come. This community system is now what uh, is now being used in many different destinations. Dr. Rob is, I think, currently working in uh, Borneo and other places to continue his, his ideas of the community-based sanctuary that we can visit when we travel to those destinations. Now, many of you remember a few years ago, the hurricanes that ripped through the Caribbean, especially Puerto Rico. And more recently, you know, Haiti got hit again, and uh, Dominican Republic, uh, but it was really something else in 20, I believe it was 2018, that the hurricanes, or might've been, yeah, I think it was 2018 that the hurricanes came through um, and just destroyed so much of Puerto Rico, especially. And I have a guide there, Gabriel, who does all of our Caribbean tours. And he never stopped working uh, in his neighborhood after the hurricanes hit. I offered to bring him to the US uh, to stay with our family here, he and his wife. And he decided to stay there and help rebuild his neighborhood. And that's the type of people that I want to have working with me. And that's who I choose. But so many destinations throughout the Caribbean were affected, and it's Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Cuba are some of the most popular destinations. And yes, we're allowed to visit Cuba, and we run tours there every year, well, except for last year. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what has happened over the pandemic in, in some places especially that were uh, excruciatingly affected. But I'll start with Puerto Rico here, and they have some wonderful wetlands. And these places are bouncing back after the hurricanes. And typically we've got blue skies and gentle breezes and, and that's how we picture the Caribbean. But after the hurricanes in September, 2017, uh, Hurricane Irma hit with as a category five, a very, very powerful storm. And then Maria struck shortly after that and did even more damage. These flamingos were found uh, on a beach in Cuba. And so I partnered immediately with Birds Caribbean. And I love partnering with different organizations uh, and just allowing those partnerships to grow. But at that time, it was so urgent. I partnered with Birds Caribbean and created a GoFundMe account. And we had a couple of big uh, birding festival events that happened in September and October and November. And I offered that, hey, if we hit $10,000 in donations through our GoFundMe, that Wildside would add another $10,000. And though I hoped it would happen, I, I didn't think that it would. But you know what? In just two weeks, we hit that $10,000. And at the end of uh, October, I was able to hand over $25,000 to Birds Caribbean. And that just made us feel wonderful. And our guides, uh, well, Gabriel in the Caribbean and our guides throughout the Caribbean jumped in and started helping. And along with Birds Caribbean, uh, they created the Caribbean Birding Trail. And a portion of our fees all go to Birds Caribbean to help them uh, continue to build this birding trail. But even more importantly, they, they were given a lot of money, not only what we raised, but other organizations were jumping in and helping out as well. And they were able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to put towards restoration of the wild areas that were destroyed. And one of the ways to do that was to make sure they kept all the local conservation employees working so that they could restore the habitat and survey the, the surviving birds uh, and see what was needed. So the money went back into not only the habitat and the wildlife, but also the people that lived there and helped protect all of that. These islands have many endemic species of birds and endemic means that it's not found anywhere else in the world but that location. So they are very obviously vulnerable to natural disasters. And so whether it's the beautiful uh, Puerto Rican toady or the Puerto Rican nightjar uh, or this elfin woods warbler, which is not even uh, discovered by, uh, by science until the 1970s, 
it's just incredible that a bird le was left undiscovered for that many years, even though the first book about these Caribbean birds was written in the late 1800s. And these are in the mountains of Western Puerto Rico. And they're a tiny little bird, but we still see them every time we go to visit Puerto Rico, along with the endemic Puerto Rican bullfinches and Adelaide's warblers and Puerto Rican tanagers and several different species of flycatchers and vireos and orioles and blackbirds and even owls are found on these islands. Some are colorful, some not quite as colorful and some just kind of drab like this lizard cuckoo. And of course there are introduced species because people loved having birds in cages that they brought from other countries and then let them go. Uh, like the scaly breasted munia and the orange cheek waxbills and the white winged parakeets that compete with the local species. In fact, the Puerto Rican parrot is quite endangered because of uh, the nesting being taken over by non native species. So we may see some Venezuelan tropials being attacked by one of the native great kingbirds. Green herons are native, even though they're also found in North America and the U.S. Um, so they're not endemic to any of these islands, but they are native. They are there naturally, as are yellow-crowned night herons and mangrove cuckoos. Very beautiful bird found not only in the mangroves, but up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, where we can also find American kestrels and red-tailed hawks, this one being pestered by a kingbird. And we can find least grebes and, yes, even flamingos and black whiskered vireos, which are different from the Puerto Rican vireo, uh, and they do migrate to North America to breed. But we have American coots alongside Caribbean coots, and this one is actually a hybrid of the two. We can find lesser Antillean peewees and Puerto Rican emeralds and Antillian, uh, crested Antillean hummingbirds and green-throated caribs. So many different species like pearly-eyed thrashers and mass ducks and white cheek pintails that we'll also see in the Galapagos Islands out in the Pacific. So there's so many different species here that we can enjoy so many different colors or lack of color. And, you know, just different varieties like scaly nape pigeons and our spotted sandpipers that use this as a stop off point, as do northern perulas as they migrate. And in areas like uh, Trinidad, we can find purple honey creepers. Uh, an introduction to the South American species, as uh, Trinidad is just, this is the female, but Trinidad is just seven miles off the coast of Venezuela. So they get the South American species, but they also have some endemics. The tufted coquette is native to South America, as is <coughs> the uh, uh, scarlet ibis found in the Carony Swamp and along the northern coast of South America. Absolutely a beautiful bird, especially when you get to see them at sunset. From here, we're going to move on to the Amazon basin. And you hear a lot about the Amazon in the news and climate change and all the things that are affecting the forest of the Amazon, from uh, burning of the forest to create more ranch, ranch land and farmlands. And we don't really even realize, most people don't realize how big the Amazon basin is. Now, most of it is in Brazil, so that's what we think of for the Amazon is Brazil. And most of the river is in Brazil, the, the actual Amazon River. But the Amazon actually uh, starts in northern Peru. And this is a beautiful spot in northern Peru. But you can see not only Peru, but Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, all of these countries, Bolivia have uh, a section of the Amazon basin. But Peru, like I mentioned, that's where the Amazon begins. But there's a lot of other rivers that flow into it to create the Amazon from Ecuador, like the Rio Napo, or from Southern Peru, the uh, Madre de Dios River. And they flow into the Marañón or the uh, Ukiali rivers, which are the two main rivers that come together to form the Amazon River, which flows all the way across into the Atlantic River or yeah, Atlantic Ocean. In the Amazon, we can find these huge Victoria lilies with their beautiful flowers that smell like Bazooka Joe bubblegum for those uh, old enough to remember Bazooka Joe. And we can explore the rivers and creeks in the flooded forest by boat 
seeing these odd Hoatsons and Amazon Kingfishers and Ring Kingfishers <coughs> and beautiful capped herons. And yes, more of the long-nosed bats. They range from Central America all the way down into South America. We can find different species of morpho butterflies and map wings and malachite butterflies and beautiful insects like uh, rainbow grasshoppers and pink-toed tarantulas. Now, you cannot be afraid of a pink-toed tarantula. We can find collared tree runners and these really cool giraffe frogs, very well named, looking like uh, the spots of a giraffe. And we can find barred monkey frogs and even some cool snakes. Now, not all of them are venomous. Like this one is just a, it's a racer. Uh, but we may, be, may come across him as we look for black-fronted nunbirds and oriole blackbirds and scarlet crowned barbettes. And we motor around through the Amazon on basically what's a floating hotel. It's a big riverboat, nice air-conditioned cabins, a nice big uh, area for us to sit and hang out and talk about our day. And uh, we've got a crew of about 14 people that run our boats and um, cook our meals and keep things clean. So it's, it's a great way to travel. And as you can tell, I mean, we're really helping with the local uh, economy by bringing so many people to these areas and employing so many people to run these boats. Now, we also go on excursions where we may meet a lot of the local people, go out and go canoeing with, uh, with some of the local folks supporting their cultural activities. <clears throat> we can enjoy the fishermen bringing up a haul and buy some of their fish that we'll eat on the boat. And they enjoy talking about the catch of the day. We can visit a family who with the, uh, the help of our uh, local uh, riverboat or the help of our riverboat chef, the, the local folks can cook a meal for us all properly supervised uh, so it's all safe and extremely delicious, um, and it's all made from what the local people would typically eat. And we can also visit the schools in these areas. They don't get a lot of visitors, and so we always make sure that the first thing we do once we land in Iquitos, uh, but before we board our riverboat, we go shopping in the local stores. So once again, helping the economy in these stores, in these small towns, uh, buying school supplies that many of these children uh, just cannot afford to buy on their own. So we'll buy school supplies and bring them to the different villages as we travel along the river. And we'll meet other people here too, not only the school children and the teachers and the parents of the children, but we may take a, a visit for local shaman or um, other people that are important in the village and learn more about how their villages are run, uh, and also to try to uh, bring in some more money by buying uh, many handmade products that they sell. All the while, enjoying birds like this endemic white-eared jacamar, and the beautiful cream-colored woodpeckers, and slate-colored hawks, <clears throat> and more black-colored hawks. We saw them uh, in Belize. And we may find some horned screamers, a very large and loud shorebird about the size of a goose. And here we can also find gray river dolphins and even pink river dolphins. And they get pinker as they feed and their capillaries expand, creating that pink hue. Here we can find three-toed and two-toed sloths. And most of our trips we find eight, nine, maybe even ten different species of primates. Uh, like squirrel monkeys, and tamarins, and woolly monkeys, and night monkeys, and the smallest monkey in the world, the tiny little pygmy marmoset, so small, it can sit in the palm of your hand. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier about the Galapagos Islands. <clears throat> and again, uh, when you see this uh, program, I will have just gotten back from my 41st tour to the Galapagos Islands. So I've been leading tours there since 2001. <clears throat> and uh, I have to say, 
I can't wait to go back again. And I'll be back there three more times in 2022, at least three more times. A couple of the trips are filling up, so I may have to add some more. But it's such a magnificent place. Now, some people may not know where the Galapagos lie, and they are uh, off the coast of Ecuador, so northern South America, about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador on the equator. So you would think, oh, wow, they're really hot. Well, guess what? It's not. Um, if you go during, uh, oh, say, late November through uh, April, yes, it will be very hot and humid and wet. Uh, but I don't go during those times. I prefer to go June, July, August, September, and October. Those are my favorite times to be in the Galapagos Islands. Temperature is about 80 degrees. Nice breeze. Often wake up to just a little bit of mist. Uh, to cool things off, and it's just absolutely wonderful. And we can fly to the Galapagos Islands from Ecuador. So we have to fly to Ecuador from the U.S. So from Miami, it's about four hours, so not bad. And then from uh, Quito, Ecuador, uh, it's another 45-minute uh, well, flight to the coast and then another 90-minute flight from the coast to uh, to the islands. Now. The islands, since they do have an airport, actually two airports, there are some islands with population. One of those islands is way to the east, uh, San Cristobal Island, and that is actually the governmental seat of the Galapagos, but it's not the highest population. So Puerto Bacareza Moreno and its uh, neighboring community, Progreso, total about 7,000 people. The biggest population is found on Santa Cruz, right in the middle of the Galapagos Islands. And on the southern side of Santa Cruz, we have Puerto Ayora, which has about 20, 000, uh, 20 to 25,000 population. So San Cristobal, I forgot to hit the button there to give you the, uh, the marker there. San Cristobal, Puerto, uh, Puerto Bacares Moreno, has, like I mentioned, about 7,000 people. Then we have Santa Cruz, about 20 to 25,000. And then Puerto Villamil on the southern coast of uh, Isabella. Now, Isabella Island is the biggest island, but it doesn't have a very big population, uh, about 3,000 people. And then the island of Floriana, way down uh, on the southern edge of the islands, has about 300 people, just a tiny little town on the western edge. So when we fly to the Galapagos, there's two airports, one on San Cristobal and one on Santa Cruz. We'll land in the Galapagos Islands and we will go through another immigration. So we've already given our passports and all that to Ecuador um, to get stamped, uh, but we could get them stamped again in the Galapagos. So even though it is Ecuador still, uh, it's nice to get that Galapagos stamp of the National Park logo in your, uh, in your passport. But here we also pay our National Park fee. So that stamp proves that we paid that fee. And the fee right now is about $100 per person. It will be going up. Um, it was supposed to go up for 2020, uh, but with the pandemic, they held off making any major changes like that. And that fee not only protects the Galapagos, but it also goes into protecting all of the national parks of Ecuador. So even though there's fees to the other parks, they can't bring in as much money as the Galapagos can because of its uniqueness and people wanting to travel there to board a yacht to see such incredible scenery. There's 90 boats that are licensed in the Galapagos and they're running new groups every week. So you figure the average number of people per yacht is about 20. Now there are some bigger boats and there are some smaller boats. Like the boat that we travel on, we only take 14 participants on our yacht plus our leaders. But even that, you figure that's $1,400 a week just from one boat. So some people tell me that we shouldn't visit the Galapagos Islands. And I just can't imagine that. Because not visiting the islands is the best way to make sure that they are destroyed. But these people say that in order to protect them, we shouldn't visit them. We shouldn't set foot on these islands. The problem is 
once again, if you don't visit a place, you don't necessarily have that connection to want to protect it. And as we found out, with no visitors to the Galapagos Islands, and remember it is a UNESCO site, without our visitation, once the pandemic hit, once Ecuador was locked down and no tourism was coming in, immediately China sent 260 fishing boats to the Galapagos Islands to fish in the UNESCO Protected Marine Preserve. So just imagine if nobody was there to protect it forever. The uniqueness of the Galapagos Islands would be gone completely. Imagine not seeing a beach full of sea lions with incredible birds flying overhead, wonderful scenery, and birds like the brown noddies at sunset and enjoying wimbrels that we often see uh, during migration and great blue herons, familiar species that we see in North America, though in much less uh, uh, familiar scenes such as this lava flow on Santiago Island and eating a black tip cardinal fish. <clears throat> we can find endemic species like the lava herons related to the green herons and the striated herons that are found in the mangroves in the Galapagos. And we can find the very odd land iguana, or I'm sorry, the marine iguana that feeds on algae in the cold waters of the Pacific here. Now the water around the islands is about 65 degrees, so it's a little chilly for a snorkeling, but you put on a wetsuit and, you know, we dive in for about 45 minutes to an hour each day to enjoy uh, what's under the sea, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but these amazing creatures, they feed on algae in the ocean for about 20 to 30 minutes per day in this cold water, and then spend the rest of the day digesting that food and warming up in the sun. On some of the islands, we can find some brightly colored land iguanas as well. They don't go into the ocean. They feed on the cactus pads and cactus fruit. And there's several different species of the land iguanas on different islands. But the waters are cold, as I mentioned, so we can also find penguins here. And these are endemic penguins, Galapagos penguins, found nowhere else in the world. And they're on the equator. And some of them, actually in the Northern Hemisphere. So when anybody tells you there's no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere, you can tell them about the Galapagos penguin. It's fun to catch them swimming in the, in the water as we motor around in the, in the zodiacs, but it's even more fun when we go snorkeling and they come up and blow bubbles in our face. We can also get the sea lions coming around playing with us and, you know, grabbing our, uh, uh, GoPro cameras off the selfie stick and blowing bubbles in our face. So that's a lot of fun, but we can also see lots of colorful fish, king angel fish and yellow-tailed surgeons and hieroglyphic hawkfish and Pacific boxfish and even green sea turtles just ignoring us as they feed on the algae. We'll have spotted eagle rays swim by and don't ignore the, uh, the urchins because they can be quite sharp if you bump into them. But we can enjoy the chocolate chip stars or more rays like the uh, manta rays and even Galapagos sharks and hammerhead sharks and white tip reef sharks. And we can find blue chin parrotfish and bicolored parrotfish and guinea fowl puffers that actually come in two different colors. This kind of navy blue with white speckles and a bright yellow. And we can find dusky chub and more yellow tailed surgeon fish. And if you don't snorkel, you can still see stuff that's underwater like these stingrays in nice shallow uh, nursing area. On the beach, we can find ghost crabs and hermit crabs, and on the rocky shorelines, Sally Lightfoot crabs, those beautiful shades of red and orange and light blue. And we can also find some smaller reptiles, such as lava lizards and there are a few Galapagos striped snakes, rarely ever seen, unfortunately, uh, but they are not venomous. And we can find more migrants, like American oyster catchers, and more endemics, like the lava gulls. And there are four species of mockingbirds found in the islands. The ones named Galapagos mockingbird, 
are the most common and found on many of the islands. But on San Cristobal, we have one species, the San Cristobal Mockingbird, and then the Española Mockingbird found on the island of Española. Quite curious little birds and great to get some wide angle close up photos. But then there's the Charles Mockingbird or now called the Floriana Mockingbird, which is no longer found on the island of Floriana. It's only found on an island, a little satellite island off the coast of Floriana called Champion. Uh, and also another little island called Gardner. And that's it. On Champion, there's about 24 pair of these cardinal or these uh, mockingbirds left. So it's a very endangered species. And thank goodness there are some organizations that you can contribute to that, uh, that are working on projects to protect these. And one that I just found out about and did not add it to the uh, program yet is called Rewild. It's R-E colon W-I-L-D. And believe it or not, it is actually an organization uh, funded, created and funded by the actor Leonardo DiCaprio. So I was really impressed to learn how much he loved the Galapagos, that he wanted to put a lot of money into the Galapagos. And uh, I currently am writing a book about the Galapagos that'll be out uh, from Princeton Press next year, along with my co-author, John Kreischer, who wrote the original version of it 20 years ago. We're updating it with my photographs. And uh, we are definitely going to be mentioning uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in that book for all the work that he's doing there, as well as the other organizations like the uh, uh, Charles Darwin Research Station that is doing so much to bring back the tortoises and, uh, and other very endangered species within the Galapagos. Now, some of the birds are not that endangered. This mangrove warbler, a, a relative of the yellow warbler, they're found in every single habitat in the islands. And the warbler finches, one of the many uh, of Darwin's finches as they're known, there's now 17 species known of Darwin's finches, this is the warbler finch, very fine, sharp bill, and the medium ground finch, very common through many of the islands, and the woodpecker finch, which actually will break off cactus spines to use as a tool to reach into holes and pull out insect larvae. And we can find common cactus finch and the vegetarian finch that not only eats seeds and berries like the other finches, but also flowers and leaves. And very rarely seen is the secretive Galapagos Crake found in the highlands of a few of the islands. In those highlands is where we can also find giant tortoises. Now the tortoises on Santa Cruz Island can grow to be about 500 pounds or more, but typically around 500 pounds. Just an incredible behemoth. The tortoises on San Cristobal Island are a little bit smaller and they have a little bit of what's called an intermediate shell. So you can see that the part above the neck there is raised up a bit because the food that it feeds on is up a little bit higher than those larger tortoises. Now throughout these islands we can find brown pelicans and in the hypersaline ponds we can see many, many flamingos. And this is the same flamingo that's found in the Caribbean, the American flamingo. And remember I mentioned the white cheek pintail ducks as well, found in the Caribbean and in the Galapagos Islands. But we do have the Galapagos hawk, only found in the Galapagos, and not on every island either. And they eat small birds, they eat lizards and young iguanas, and they're also a scavenger. Here we can find Galapagos flycatchers searching for bugs like the painted locust. This locust is about four inches long. We can find Galapagos shearwaters along the coast and nesting in the rocks along the coast. And that's one of the issues uh, of the islands. These, so many of the different species nest in the rocks. And when people came to live on these islands, they brought cats and dogs and pigs that often went feral on the populated islands. And even on the islands that were not populated, they would take them so that they could basically farm more animals. And the rats would always follow them. They would be on the boats along with the livestock and then jump out onto these other islands. And so you've got these birds nesting in the rocks and the rats 
would eat the eggs and even eat the chicks and even the adult birds. So a lot of programs were began in the 70s and 80s to eradicate a lot of these species that nest in the rocks like the shearwater and the red-billed tropic birds, which I never ever tire of photographing. <coughs> And the blue-footed boobies, in fact, there's three species of boobies, though. The blue-footed is the icon of the Galapagos Islands. Diving from up to 50 feet up, much easier to photograph when they're standing on the rocks. <coughs> and we hope to see them doing their courtship dance, which often, uh, or typically leads to nesting. And they nest on the ground where they're vulnerable to feral cats and rats. So we want to learn how to protect these birds uh, through research and studying them and studying how we can eradicate, safely eradicate, the rats and cats from these islands where they don't belong. So the birds like the, the blue-footed booby and this Nazca booby, another species that nest on the ground, and the red-footed boobies, which can perch in trees as well. In fact, they nest in their trees and sometimes perch on people. So we really want to uh, learn more about protecting the wildlife and what does not belong on these islands. So we have all these endemic species that are very vulnerable because they're only found in these islands, like the Galapagos dove and uh, the Genovesa ground finch, which is only found on the island of Genovesa, as is the Genovesa cactus finch. While other species, uh, like the frigate birds, are found on many different islands, The short-eared uh, short owls are only found on a few. And even the fur seals, the Galapagos fur seals, which are actually a sea lion, not a seal, uh, misnamed by the, uh, the whalers many, many years ago, um, they were actually hunted to near extinction by the whalers as the whaling areas were decimated. They started hunting the, the sea, the, uh, the fur sea lions as well. But we come to these islands to really enjoy all the wildlife and get a better understanding. And by visiting them, like I said, our dollars go into the national park, as well as all the other national parks throughout Ecuador. And so we can protect the short-eared owls that are found here, and even the ubiquitous mangrove warblers that are found in every habitat and the sea lions because they're all part of this natural land here and they're all part of the natural balance of that ecosystem. So where you have lava lizards, you know you'll have Galapagos hawks that may feed on them. And the islands that have the many, many uh, marine iguanas, they need to be protected as well from climate change because what's happening is the water gets a little bit warmer, the algae dies off, so they have to swim further and further out to the colder waters and go deeper and deeper, and that's exhausting. Remember I said they only spend 20 to 30 minutes feeding in the water per day, but if they have to go further, they could spend hours and they just aren't built for that. They're a cold blooded animal and spending hours in the cold water will unfortunately uh, kill them eventually. And during the El Nino years where the waters warm up too much or the La Nina years, uh, just the opposite, things can happen in these, the wildlife, we can lose 50% of the population of uh, the marine iguanas. It's, it's quite frightening. So as we watch the frigate birds fly overhead, this one with a seahorse in its mouth, we may also, on the island of Española, find the waved albatrosses. And I say on the island of Española because these birds live out at sea, and they only come to the island of Española to nest. One other little island right off the coast of Ecuador has a few nesting pairs, but the majority are on the island of Española, and only Española, nowhere else in the islands. And so we'll see them flying all around the island. And also 
nesting on the islands. We'll see them waddling along the, the trail, raising a young, doing their courtship dance. And they meet up every year. They, they are, uh, they made for life. And they come back to the island after being apart for a year. They don't stay together out at sea. They'll be apart for a year, come back, do their courtship dance, lay the egg, raise the chick, hopefully. And once the chick is ready to fledge, they do their courtship dance again, saying, farewell, I'll see you next year. So as this male frigate bird is staring into the sunset, I'll share a Galapagos sunset with you in hopes that you'll help us <clears throat> to protect this wonderful, incredible area. And with that, I want to talk to you about one final destination. And it's in remote India, the most northeastern state of India called Nagaland. It's in the Naga Hills along the border with Burma, uh, also known as Myanmar. Now, when most people think of India, they, they know that there's a lot of great birds there, like rollers and bulbuls. And of course, we can find some cool bugs like dragonflies and grasshoppers and big spiders. <clears throat> and of course, we can find elephants. And, you know, one of the things that people think about is, you know, the, the workers of these elephants. But quite honestly, it's, it's not a good idea to necessarily ride the elephants. And uh, it, it's becoming it's becoming much less appropriate to do so, even though it does help the local economy. What I'd rather do is protect the wild elephants. Putting the money towards the wild elephants and protecting them in these areas, this is actually in the state of Assam, right next to Nagaland. Having them roam wild there is just amazing to see. And so even though we see elephants throughout the town being used as, as worker beasts, like horses and camels, um, we'd much prefer to see them out in the wild without human intervention, where we can also find the extremely endangered Asian one-horned rhino. So in 2017, I visited Nagaland. It was uh, up till very recently a restricted state. Only Indian citizens could visit there. And you can see just that red little area on the right-hand side of the map. That is Nagaland. <clears throat> so it's surrounded by Bhutan, Nepal, and Bangladesh all around India there. And when we visit there, the first thing we notice is the beautiful Naga Hills. It is a bit of a challenge to get there, uh, flying from the U.S. to Delhi, is uh, about a 12-hour flight and then uh, we have to fly from Delhi to Jorhat which takes up another full day and then from Jorhat we drive up into the Naga Hills which because of the roads takes another full day. Um, they're working on the roads trying to make them better but for right now they're a little a little scary at times um, shall I say exhilarating at times <clears throat> But once we get there, we get up to the top of the hills where the villages are built, and we get to meet the people, we realize that even though it is India, uh, their culture is quite different from what we think of as the Indian culture. It's much more similar to that of Myanmar. An absolutely beautiful and fun, gracious people. We get to meet a lot of the folks here. In fact, they opened up our homes to, the, uh, to us. They opened up their homes and allowed us to stay there for a week. And we met the elders of this one gentleman whose home we used. His mother was, at uh, when I took this shot, 98, and his father, 102. And that was in 2017. <clears throat> and as a young man, he had fashioned this spear that he used to kill his very first tiger, but not before it scarred his hand pretty well. But we got to meet the people who shared their daily lives with us, shucking the or husking the, the rice and singing and enjoy, laughing and just enjoying the work as they went along, doing it together. The local fishermen stopping by with a catch that we could purchase from him and use to 
uh, cook over the open fire. In fact, they do not have uh, any appliances. They don't use refrigerators. They don't use ovens. Even though they do have electricity, they still use inside and out, either an open hearth or an open fire. Now, what we did here, um, we visited Nagaland for a specific reason. The person in the back there is Scott Widensaw, <clears throat> whom you may recognize that name. He had a Pulitzer Prize finalist book in 2000 called Living on the Wind. And in 2000, um, when that book was introduced, it was all about uh, bird migration in the Western Hemisphere. Well, now 20 years later, he just published a new book called A World on the Wing, <clears throat> kind of a sequel that is now a global migration book. And with this book, uh, he talks about our expedition to Nagaland to see the falcons that were being persecuted, being hunted, being trapped, snared by the tens of thousands during the period where they migrated through about a 10 day period every October into November. Nchomo was a former hunter, now turned birding guide. It's one of the most amazing conservation stories of all time, where the woman that was with Scott there, uh, Bono, she saw what was happening and she started a program with help from other local organizations and local people. Remember, it's restricted area. <clears throat> and she was able to convince the people through education to no longer hunt the falcons. And the elders of the villages all voted to never hunt them again, <clears throat> and in fact, protect them. And here you can see one of the conservation posters behind another one of the former hunters. And these posters can be found on houses in so many of the villages. So we came here to see this phenomena. And oh my gosh, we got there first thing in the morning to see the falcons for the first time, and it was dark and quiet, and we didn't hear anything, and we were worried that they weren't gonna be there. But then as it started to lighten up, we could see them by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, <clears throat> flying close, flying far. Just an incredible sight to find these Amor falcons. They nest in Siberia and Mongolia and fly through the Naga Hills every year to Southern Africa, across the Indian Ocean. They've got this incredible migration route and they stop in the Naga Hills to feed, gorging themselves on insects. And again, they're there by the tens of thousands and currently, or hundreds of thousands actually. And currently we are the only tour company that are helping to replace the monies that the hunters are not uh, getting anymore from, uh, from hunting these falcons. So, there are organizations there now that Bono started that are training them to be birding guides. And so we are bringing people there to go birding and to see this amazing falcon spectacle, bringing our dollars to these villages to help them continue to protect these birds. So I thank you all for letting me talk to you about all these wonderful destinations and hopefully you will have the opportunity to visit them someday, and possibly even with us. <clears throat> so once again, I thank you very much for joining me today. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact Wildside Nature Tours. Our website is wildsidenaturetours.com. <clears throat> thank you again, and hope you have a great rest of the day.